West Virginia football under Don Nealon continues to attract nationwide attention. In seven years, the Mountaineers have developed a reputation that is a direct reflection of the Nealon football philosophy. And in 1986, the established trademarks again were evident. A hard-hitting defense. Excellence in the kicking game. Intense special teams play. And above all, a commitment to accomplishment that has become the hallmark of Mountaineer football. In terms of wins and losses, it was not a typical year, but the blending of opportunity, circumstance old and new to uphold the Mountaineer tradition made 1986 a season for optimism. The 1986 West Virginia University football highlights are presented by Magnet Bank. As summer 1986 faded, football practice opened in Morgantown. To a man, the Mountaineers looked bigger, stronger, and faster. A summer of preparation was giving way to a fall full of expectation. Six home games, five away, added up to the greatest schedule in West Virginia football history. The course would be a tough one, but the Mountaineers seemed ready to hurdle any obstacle. Miami of Florida, Boston College, Maryland, Syracuse, and eventual national champion Penn State would visit the intimidating confines of Mountaineer Field. Pitt and Virginia Tech loomed as stern tests on the road. The youngest team of the Neyland era would face college football's most trying home schedule. The challenge to these players was the greatest in their young lives. And for the coaches, too, the upcoming season meant a test of unparalleled difficulty. I don't know who put this football schedule together, but uh, needless to say, that's quite a challenge. Uh, but our young football team's ready for this challenge, and we're looking forward to it. Outside, the Mountaineers polished play patterns and specialty defenses. Inside, workers put finishing touches on the West Virginia football facilities complex. An ambitious expansion project added glowing details to an already impressive showcase of football facilities. A fully serviced 7,500-seat bowl, reminiscent of old Mountaineer Field, caps the uppermost layer of new construction. Below, the list of additions includes a theater-type team meeting room, a posh player's lounge, study and training tables, and expanded weight rooms. Looking out majestically over the playing field, an enlarged multi-purpose room highlights the features as a comfortable home for players and supporters alike. Superlatives aside, important factors for continued success are now housed within these walls. Factors that play upon West Virginia's tradition-laden past, its storied present, its bright future. With our great facilities here at West Virginia University, it's very easy to put the game plan together. The defense has their room, the offense has their room, the quarterbacks have their room. You put it all together and it's a functional building. Great to come up with the game plan. September 6th, 1986. A day that marked another beginning for Mountaineer football. With the brand new additions and the boisterous crowd basking in the sunshine of Mountaineer Field, the faithful were soon glowing in the excitement of an offensive performance that racked up 530 yards total output versus Northern Illinois. Previously unsung heroes were everywhere. Tailbacks John Hollyfield and Undra Johnson with nearly 100 yards apiece. Larry Holly and Eric Lester with a dozen tackles each on the other side of the ball. But it was junior Pat Randolph who made the afternoon one to put in the record books. And the ball is at the four yard line. Pat Randolph is in that backfield. John Talley is set out to the left. And here's the ball given to Randolph. He finds the opening up the middle. He's to the 20, the 25. He's racing. He is on the way. If they can't catch him, the 50, the 40, the northern 30. They're after him. Down to the 10. Go. Go, Randolph. He's into the end zone. Touchdown. West Virginia. Pat Randolph carries the football. 96 yards for the TD. And he's being mobbed in the end zone. Week two. 
as the Mountaineers went into Greenville, North Carolina for a night game against East Carolina. West Virginia loomed as the biggest home game on a schedule that included Penn State and Miami. The Pirates were ready to stage an ambush, but in the final minute and a half, quarterback Mike Kimko took center stage. It was Kimko to Harvey Smith, Kimko to Grantis Bell, then to Bell again, and a pass to Keith Wynn in a drive that covered 69 yards. And with just six seconds remaining on the clock, it was. They're lining up to run a play, and it's lobbed into the end zone, and here it is caught! It is caught by Harvey Smith! He got out beyond two defensive backs as they lined up quickly with time running out on them, and Tipco lobbed it into the near corner of the end zone, and Harvey Smith got in behind McCallum and London. Proving they could win in the clutch, the Mountaineers again showed they could win on the road. West Virginia came home to a capacity crowd and the Maryland Terrapins. Coming up short on the scoreboard, the Mountaineers nonetheless mounted a host of impressive statistics against the visitors. 19 first downs, 308 yards of total offense, more than 200 through the air, and a 51-yard kickoff return by Darren Fulton, one of the exciting new players emerging in the Mountaineer tradition. At the heart of Mountaineer tradition, the backyard brawl with Pitt. Only the seniors on the West Virginia squad could remember the last loss to the Pitt Panthers. The 79th renewal of the intense rivalry promised to be another hard-hitting physical game. During pregame warm-ups, safety Travis Curtis went down with an injury. His backup, Bo Orlando, was injured on the game's opening play. Into the lineup came rookie Preston Waters, quickly gaining a first-hand education into the ways of college football. Waters was just one of the unknowns who surfaced as somebodies during the 1986 campaign. Especially on defense, their impact was obvious. Lester, Warren, Dixon, Pickett, Wilson, Whitten, these became the core of the new Mountaineer linebackers that would no doubt rival the greats who had come before them. And up front, it was Parker, Marlott, and Moses whose names were mentioned in a big way. It became obvious throughout the season, Mountaineer football had a future for many years to come. West Virginia is known for its linebacker tradition. Such greats as Dow Talley, Dennis Folks, Freddie Smalls. I work in to be my best and to help carry on that tradition. October loomed as a preview of the holiday season, with four bowl-bound opponents on the horizon. Starting the festivities at revenge-minded Virginia Tech, a great defensive effort renewed optimism in West Virginia's ability to throttle an opponent. Also in October came a Boston College team with a score to settle. Their Heisman Trophy winners of the past had not been able to beat the Mountaineers. This year again, the matchup was one of the closest games of the season. Sandwiched in between was a rare opportunity, a chance to test the nation's top-ranked team on the turf of Mountaineer Field. The Miami Hurricanes brought their own Heisman winner to Morgantown. The eyes of the nation followed intently on ABC television. The commonplace again had become a reality. West Virginia playing a nationally ranked team on national television, a recognized part of the excitement surrounding Mountaineer football. Most people feel playing the number one team in America is a real challenge for West Virginia, but you know if you're honest and you look back, we've played the number one team almost every year for the past four years. Halloween weekend. In this witching hour, the schedule brought nemesis Penn State to Morgantown. The eventual national champions were a gruesome test for any team. But on this night, again on nationwide television, the Mountaineer defense turned the trick, holding the Lions to just 19 points, their second lowest offensive output of the regular season. Hard hitting, fierce pursuit, and a refusal to yield the end zone made this late night performance the finest hour for a tried and tested Mountaineer defense. It was a moment for several defensive mainstays to take their bows. Travis Curtis and Larry Holly in the secondary. 
Brad Hunt and David Grant on the defensive line. And in the middle, a man who made a career out of playing linebacker inside, outside, or upside down. A tremendous tackler blessed with skill, speed, and stamina. Matt Smith led the Mountaineer defense in the statistics and on the field. I think playing for West Virginia University is one of the greatest opportunities a young man could have coming out of high school. I mean, they have the best facilities I've ever seen and one of the best coaching staffs in the country. I think the education you get here is a quality education that's going to help you later in life after you play football. Come in, come in, come in. A road game at Rutgers provided a test at weathering not only the Scarlet Knights, but the elements themselves. A steady downpour saw the Mountaineers down seven points entering the final quarter, with quarterback Ben Reed injured on the last possession. Into the fray came Tim Coe, who piloted the Golden Blue 159 yards in the final stanza. 200 Johnson touchdowns and a pair of Matt Smith interceptions later, West Virginia again found itself a victor on enemy turf. A game at Louisville was a similar challenge as the Mountaineers continued to persevere in the chilling mist of Kentucky against an opponent that declared this to be their bowl game. Character again won out, exemplified in the scoring column by the Mountaineer who crossed the goal line three times that afternoon. A walk-on who had made the climb to a spot in the starting lineup, senior fullback Chris Pecon scored the first rushing touchdowns of his career of overachievement. The Nealon instilled attributes of hard work, attitude, and gutty persistence had come full circle. And in the season finale against Syracuse, fans were already anticipating another football fall in Morgantown. Looking ahead to the 1987 football season, we see a very challenging schedule, but we also see more veteran football players than we've had in the past. And if the good Lord's willing and our young players work hard this winter, I think that we'll meet that challenge head on. The perennial Eastern powers, Maryland, Boston College, Syracuse, Virginia Tech, Pitt, and national champion Penn State retain their annual places on the tough Mountaineer schedule. Added to that list, the Big Ten Buckeyes of Ohio State, in only the second meeting of the two schools staged this century. To face that challenge, a returning group of bright young players barely tested but already proven in their abilities. And new Mountaineers with distinguished credentials eager to don the golden blue. Together, they will forge an answer to the questions posed in 1986. Ever present at the helm, the irrepressible Don Nealon, whose dedication to hard work and commitment to excellence have already formed the mold for the success to be cast again next season. His trademarks will remain constant. Defense, special teams, and above all, an unrelenting intensity both foes and followers have come to expect. The 1986 season has passed, leaving behind its lessons learned. Out of victory and defeat, success and failure, come the seeds that yield hope for the future, making 1987 another season for optimism. A Season for Optimism was presented by Magnet Bank.